if you're going to space, do you want one robot or a hundred? How about a thousand? With new technology designed and demonstrated by MIT scientists, maybe you don't have to choose. They're called electrovoxels, and they're tiny reconfigurable components that you can program to separate, join, change shape, even size, and perhaps live in. To find out more, we're joined by MIT PhD student Martin Nisser. Martin, welcome to Tech First. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Hey, super pumped to have you. What are electrovoxels? Yeah, so the electrovoxels are essentially a, a system of uh, reconfigurable robots. So it's this idea, uh, sometimes known as programmable matter or reconfigurable robotics, where rather than building a robot or a structure in a top-down manner, uh, we envision robots or structures as these modules of hundreds or thousands of small components or modules that can rearrange themselves with respect to their neighbors. Um, and through this kind of reconfiguration, they can acquire some kind of 3D target geometry. So essentially it's a way to kind of think about um, how modules can assemble themselves in that kind of bottom up way mm -hmm. in order to acquire a 3D shape. So you've talked about uh, robots, maybe configure robots, maybe even structures. Uh, what do you think you can build with them? Um, what do you see as, as being possible? Yeah, so generally one of the big um, kind of grand challenges with reconfigurable robots is that if you want each of these small modules to be able to move by itself, you have to embed computation, um, electronics, sensors, actuators into every module. And that's really hard to do um, as these modules get progressively smaller. Uh, and you want the modules to be very small and very numerous in order to create um, high resolution structures. And so to date, it's been very difficult to achieve um, uh, reconfiguration at the module level because you have to integrate these complex, large, expensive uh, motors into each module. So the kind of key technical contribution that we've developed is to figure out a way to embed electromagnets into the these modules in order to perform the reconfiguration, which is good because these electromagnets are really, really inexpensive uh, they're easy to manufacture and they, um, they don't require much maintenance. Mm -hmm. And so what we're hoping to do is to be able to, um, use these to develop structures and robots that can actually build, um, can be built scalably. So we can build these voxels, sorry, these, these electrovoxels or modules in very, very large numbers in a way that couldn't perhaps have done before. Cool. It's interesting that you chose voxels, of course, because that's like pixels, but volumetric pixels, right? So it's pixels in space, which which makes a lot of sense here. Uh, what, how will you power them? Uh, will there be solar? Will, will there be other sources? Yeah, exactly. So the point you're alluding to is um, that uh, one of the first kind of um, deployments we're hoping to do with these is uh, in a space environment, because you know we're figuring here on Earth against gravity. It's really, really challenging, particularly with, you know, electromagnets, which are inherently quite weak. And so we're hoping to deploy them in a, in a microgravity setting in space. And the particular applications we're thinking of is, um, you know, to be able to reconfigure, um, you know, large space structures in order to adapt to different, um, uh, different load conditions or scenarios. Uh, one thing you might want to do is change, uh, structures inertia properties, which is um, the kind of the dynamics that govern how easy it is for structure in space to rotate. Yeah. And uh, you might want to rotate an object in space in order to align it with, uh, incoming solar irradiation, for example. Interesting. Or you might want to align your, your mass a little differently if you're going to maybe, um, initiate spin or something like that for a form of artificial gravity. Yeah, ex exactly. I think that's a great example. I think so. I think there's a lot of, um, kind of exciting scenarios, um, that we envision, uh, you know, a little bit down the line, a couple of years down the line. And so we're hoping to be able to incubate this technology in the years to come in order to um, get into those. This episode is sponsored by dollar smart, my creator coin app. Yeah, it's crypto. No, it's not a scam. 
buy some to support the show, sponsor the show, get weekly rewards as the coin grows, or just to be part of the community at rally.io slash creator slash SMRT. And that makes a ton of sense because how you'd want to launch something and put uh, material through the tremendous stress of launch, you know, 5Gs, 8Gs, whatever it might be, is very different from how you want to maybe use it as astronauts are working there or as it's doing its mission in space. Talk about uh, the different components that you envision. So obviously these are voxels they, they take up a certain amount of space you might even have different size ones at a certain point but do you have an idea for what you might do will some of them have tools will some of them maybe have storage uh will some of them have power will others carry resources like maybe metals or, or components or something maybe some are even hard or others are soft if you're going to build internal surfaces that people might want to sit on or or lean against or build upon or something like that what are your thoughts there yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the kind of the fact that you started your question with, um, this problem that you, if you want to be able to use something in space, um, you don't necessarily want to have to design or build it, uh, such that it can withstand, you know, nine G's on launch. Uh, and you also hopefully want to build something. So but if I dial back for a second, everything you want to launch to space have to, has to fit within the confines of a rocket fairing. And so yep. if you want to build something that's wider than that rocket fairing, let's say it's three meters, you have to be able to package it down or disassemble it and have it deployed, self-assembled or self-folded in space. And so I think primarily we've been working on, um, kind of developing this, um, the actual electromechanical system that's capable of doing the reconfiguration. And so mm -hmm. in terms of applications, I like the ones you, you suggested, I think those are really great ideas. Uh, and what we've primarily been focused on is kind of the utility you get from the actual reconfiguration. And so if you were able to, so if, for example, right now we're working on, uh, miniaturizing these modules in order to get a little bit smaller. Um, and we want to build uh, hundreds of thousands of these that can do reconfiguration in order to, um, to enable a kind of recyclable 3d printing. So you can imagine being able to, um, have a system of modules, acquire a shape, and then when you're done with that shape, have it be able to reconfigure into another target shape. Wow. So, and so, you know, that the, the utility of the system really comes from the actual shape that you're acquiring. Um, but the, I think that's probably, you know, that's it's the, the utility of that really comes out of having a large number of modules, having them very small. And so exactly to your point, it's a, a long way of answering, uh, which is to say that, um, you're, you're asking exactly the right question. So in the, in the interim, um, we definitely want to focus on applications that can embed utility into each of these modules. So for example, you can imagine using them as, um, you know, a kind of self-sorting, um, storage containers or to, you know, think of these modules in a larger setting as being, um, uh, trying to think of them as, as, as habitats or storing mm -hmm. uh, various items inside of them. Yeah. It's exactly the right question to be asking. Uh, cool. but, uh, yeah, but so far we really only been concentrating on uh, developing the, the kind of key, uh, Take, uh, technical diffusions for them. Do you happen to have one of the uh, prototypes with you right now? Yeah. Uh, so this is one of the modules in my hand. So it's a, so it's a cubic structure. It's about 60 millimeters in side length and it has um, an electromagnet embedded in each of its 12 edges. Uh, then in the center, it has um, a few printed circuit boards and batteries, um, where the, the printed circuit boards, um, primarily house a microcontroller and what's called H bridges, which are, um, integrated circuits that allow you to regulate the direction in which you apply current through an electromagnet. So what that lets us do is to determine or rather apply um, 
to select pairs of electromagnets that will attract or oppose each other in order to actuate a pivoting mechanism. So the way an electromagnet works is that if you um, apply current down one way, it'll polarize the electromagnet in a particular uh, polarization. And if you apply it in the other way, it will polarize it in the other way. Mm -hmm. have, if you imagine two of these cubes next to each other, you can imagine having uh, a pair of electromagnets, one on each module, and firing current through each of those in different directions. And that way, you can imagine these as like uh, a north-facing magnet pointing one way, the other north-facing magnet pointing the other way. And because they're oriented like this, they'll want to attract. So those, mm -hmm. those create um, the hinge for a pivoting mechanism. And then you could take another pair of electromagnets and uh, pulse current through them in, um, in parallel directions. And that will create a repulsing force, which will actually actuate the pivoting mechanism. It's really interesting, actually, and uh, I'll, I'll show some of the footage that you have. You took a parabolic flight, so you experienced null gravity, essentially, and, and did some testing there. I'll show that. And it's quite interesting when you're in actual null G, perhaps in orbit or elsewhere, it'd be interesting to see what you could design into the system. Because what you've done so far is when they're connected and then they transform and move around in a variety of different ways, with a, a true and lasting null G environment, you might even be able to do it when they're not connected <laughs> and, and, and have more complex ways of fitting pieces and components together. Be that as it may, um, maybe talk a little bit about the testing you've done so far and what you've been able to learn. Yeah. So, um, the, so I can start by saying that, um, in, there was some, some scientists um, they developed some algorithmic work, um, that showed that if you have a 3d structure and it's comprised of cubes, so the same way that we've envisioned these, these, um, the structures made up of our cubes. So if you have this 3d structure made up of cubes, they've shown that if each of those cubes can pivot with respect to their neighbors, you can actually reconfigure your first 3d structure into any other arbitrary 3d structure conditioned on, um, the fact that you're able to do two key, um, motion primitives. And so there, that is to say there, there are two movements you need to be able to do in order to do these arbitrary reconfigurations. So one is that two cubes, if you imagine them pivoting, um, with respect to each other, you need to have two cubes that can pivot, um, around a shared axis. And then in the second, uh, the second maneuver, um, yeah, we call it a traversal. So if you, if you imagine I have two cubes in my hand and then I want a third cube to be able to move from one face on one of the cubes onto the other face of this neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so if you're able to do these two maneuvers, the, the traditional pivot and the traversal, you can reconfigure between these arbitrary shapes. And so the kind of main piece of work we wanted to do was to show that using this, this particular physical instantiation all pivoting. So using electromagnets that we are able to demonstrate these two pivoting, points, which lets us basically use their, uh, really great algorithms, um, and deploy them on our physical systems. And so what we did was, uh, we got an air table, uh, which is like an air hockey table. If you've yeah. used one of those games, so it's, uh, people who might not know, it's basically just a flat table that shoots air out of, um, little holes in the surface and it creates like a, a very low friction environment. And so we put our cubes on this table and, uh, using the air table, we we're able to simulate a microgravity environment, uh, because it's just very, very low friction. And so we, we, um, uh, we deployed, um, cubes on the air table and performed these two, these two maneuvers, the pivot traversal. Uh, and we ran that a bunch of times and made sure that the, um, the control procedures were robust. Uh, and once we had perfected the maneuvers themselves and the, the, the control policies, um, we flew the system on a parabolic flight and demonstrated the same maneuver, uh, in zero G. Uh, and that was Thanks. really important because on the actual flight, um, you have just a, just a couple of seconds, um, in order to get it right. And so you really, yes. 
cross your fingers and, and hope it works. Absolutely. And it's not cheap, I'm assuming, either uh, to get that done. It's called the Vomit Comet, at least in some uh, instances of it. And uh, I'm glad you were able to figure out that it did work. I, it, it's kind of interesting for me because my son is... Um, uh, graduating this year in mechatronics um, at the University of British Columbia. And he's doing a capstone project, uh, a robot arm for the Lunar Gateway. Um, so they're they're working on design for that. They're building a few things. They're working with, I believe, MDA, which is a Canadian space company, uh, doing that project. So hopefully some of what he's building gets in there. Maybe I should tell him to make it configurable. Uh, we'll see about that. Uh, yeah. But... Um, uh, maybe that that technology is a bit out there. Look forward, if you will, for me about five years. Uh, what do you see these uh, electrovoxels doing and being capable of? Yeah. So, so well, I think space is a space is a great environment um, to to have reconfiguration uh, and particularly to use electromagnets. So, um, and to just unpack that. Um, so the reason space is good for, is things are difficult to build and yes. uh, <laughs> things get more difficult to build if they are in harsh environments, if it's difficult to get there and if it's difficult to ship things there. And so space is a kind of like, it's the kind of the final frontier of, um, fabrication. Um, it's very, very challenging to build things there. So if you're able to have things self-assembled without the need to send astronauts up there, um, which is very dangerous and to ship everything in one go, um, that is really, really advantageous. Uh, and, uh, kind of paradoxically, um, it's an, well, it's an environment where reconfiguration is so advantageous. Um, reconfiguration is actually in, in a way much simpler because mm -hmm. in a microgravity environment, you don't have to fight gravity vectors, mm -hmm. even a very, very small force can generate very, very large velocities. So, you know, uh, figurative speaking, if a mosquito landed on, you know, a, a spacecraft, then just, you know, the fact that it landed there would actually accelerate it a little bit. <laughs> but did it land at light speed? <laughs> oh, that's a good so have, 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 have to do another podcast for that question. Yes, um, exactly. But, uh, so the space environment is fantastic. I think that's really, uh, we definitely want to explore that. Um, but one of the things we're looking at a little bit closer to home is, um, and I mentioned this briefly, um, earlier is to try to miniaturize these, uh, and we actually want to try to do reconfiguration against gravity here on earth. And so we're looking at, um, trying to make these as small as possible, um, and also to optimize the all the, per the, all the parameters that go into the electromagnets themselves. So in terms of the, the geometrical designs, the, um, the way we uh, design the, you know, the, the materials, the, 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 mm -hmm. the coil and winding number, the current we use, um, trying to optimize everything to generate as much force as possible for as small a mass as possible in order to make them as powerful and light, um, as necessary to be able to move them, um, against gravity. Uh, I'm really excited about that. I think. That is really interesting, actually, because the smaller you make them, the easier it is um, uh, as a percentage, I guess, to make them reconfigure against gravity, right? Um, uh, mass decreases by a cube function, I believe, or as, as you make things um, smaller. So that would be super, super interesting. And as you make them tiny enough, I mean, you get to that point where um, you almost have, like you said, this smart matter, this reconfigurable matter, right? That that you can um, just reassemble uh, continuously. And also if you make them small enough, you might even be able to power them off of, I don't know, radio waves or something like that, or uh, who knows what. Uh, I know some uh, tiny little Bluetooth tags are being powered off something like that. And that's a small amount of energy, but it's ambient. And in some environments, it, maybe it's not ambient. Maybe it's intentionally beamed there as well. So uh, very interesting stuff. Martin, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for having me.